This is a typical modern office, individual workers using individual computer terminals separated by individual cubicles. The only problem is real work doesn't tend to get done like this. We naturally want to share information and collaborate. So how do we merge this modern individualistic work environment with the needs for sharing and collaboration? The answer is groupware. Today we'll show you hardware and software that lets individual PC users work together on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by Intel, microprocessor technology for the software of today and tomorrow. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. And by Hewlett Packard, personal computer division. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. With me today is John Hitchens, president of PowerCore. We're talking about groupware today, John, and one of the benefits of groupware is the ability to use software to get a group of people together for a meeting. That's sometimes a very complicated task using the old-fashioned mechanism. You've got software called Network Scheduler 3, which I think was best of class at the recent groupware show. Mm -hmm. Show me how you, you would use this to put together a group meeting. Well, what we're going to do first, Stuart, is we're going to select the group that we want to schedule for the event. In this case, it's going to be the marketing department and the normal conference room that they have the, all their meetings in. Now what we've done is we've overlaid all the individual's calendars and the conference room onto the screen right now. Now we can see the days that they're busy and they're not busy, but since we've got a system here that's been empowered to help us facilitate this process, the calendaring system can go ahead and utilize a feature called free time search. And what free time search lets us do is set the parameters for the meeting that we want to have. When do we want to start? How long do we want it to last? And when's the last time that we want it to happen? And we can also set some rules like search in 30 minute increments or skip the weekends. Mm -hmm. So now what the system's doing is going out and taking all those individuals and that resources calendar and finding the first time that matches that. And it's going to come up with a time for us that shows the best fit for this meeting. We've got a busy marketing group here. Well, that's good. So it's cranking through the whole week, and we can sort of see the poor little thing thinking. Uh, I finally found a time. Great. Now it's found a time for us on 11 on Friday. So we're going to go ahead and add this event now. We could also add more details about the event. We could add an attachment if it was a marketing or a budget meeting. We could set some special mm -hmm. filters on the event, where or why codes, special purpose codes. We could even edit the event, the attendees at this point if we had forgotten somebody. Okay. So now the system's going to go out and file this event to the database and send out electronic mail notifications. So it's adjusting everybody's schedule and sending out a notice. Right. Then what happens is when the recipients of those notices get to their workstation, they come up into the network scheduler and they either confirm the event, decline the event, yeah. or send back a reason for why they think it should be changed. Okay. Network scheduler three. Thanks. All right. One approach to group where one way to get people working together electronically is through a video conference. That used to be an expensive and complicated process, but video conferencing is now coming to your desktop PC. An engineer working on a design schematic needs to confer with a colleague at another location. Up until now, he'd have to fly or drive there for an in-person meeting or fax okay. the document and confer over the telephone. So these but these engineers at Sun okay, just activate the Show Me video conferencing system for a face-to-face -face okay. discussion right at their workstations. The fact of the matter is that business is done face-to-face. -face. It's true in every culture and in every country. So we did this because we think the market is much, much broader than collaborating on a document or an idea. It's because people want to talk to each other. The Sun Show Me system includes whiteboard and shared application functions and is currently available on the SunSpark platform. Intel has introduced a similar desktop video conferencing and application sharing system for the PC. It's called ProShare. What we really are focused on is bringing the power of your PC to your one-on-one -on -one communications. Because people, uh, even though they work inside of large corporations or large companies and they interact with a lot of people, the majority of the work they get done is really one-on-one. -on -one. So what we wanted to do was facilitate that communications. Intel has donated 18 ProShare systems to the telecommuting center in Los Angeles, established after the Northridge earthquake damaged several major freeways. The telecommuting centers down here in L.A. are being set up 
to enable people to get off the freeways and onto the information highway. Intel is working with other industry players to develop interoperability standards for desktop video conferencing and application sharing systems. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. Hi, how are you doing? Very good. How about you? The key to groupware is real-time information sharing. And two of the leading applications in this area are Lotus Notes and WordPerfect Office. Here to show us how they work are John Raymer of Elf Technologies and also over there Paul Smart of WordPerfect. John, let's start with you. And first of all, uh, you're not a Lotus guy, I know, but explain Lotus Notes and how this is an example of groupware. Yeah. Notes is based on the metaphor of file folders. And if I click on each of these work pages, you can see these different square boxes. These are databases for sending and sharing information either internal to an organization or to other companies in other distant locations as well. All right, your company is Elf Technologies and you create what you call middleware on top of Lotus Notes. What does that mean? Yeah, we enchant Lotus Notes. We can take and put information from Notes into other systems or from other systems into Notes. The problem is you've got all these independently developed applications that don't necessarily interoperate. Yeah. Our little elves working tirelessly can do that. All right, we've set up a little scenario here that we're going to show an example of how we use both your technology and Lotus Notes. I'm an insurance company over here in Boston. You're a law firm somewhere on the West Coast, okay? And so I, this is my version of Lotus Notes, and I have things organized by the different kinds of uh, claims I have to deal with over here. So I call, call up my casualty claims, and these are the different ones that are going. And I say, okay, I want to take this Allen vehicle claim over here and do something with it. It's got this long file. It's been sitting here forever. I want to send it over my, to my attorneys to take care of this particular claim. I want to pick uh, your firm, Bullivant, Hauser & Bailey. You guys are in Portland, Oregon. I say, yeah, ship this entire file, all this information over to my attorneys. I've done it. What happens now? Yeah. So through replication, which is the part of notes that lets you share information, the next time I at the law firm go to look at the work I'm doing for you, notice here I have a database that says Stewart's Insurance. And there's a number there that says one. See, what notes does is give everyone their own lens into the information. So even if I go in and look at that one unread document, someone else in my firm who hasn't looked at it, mm -hmm. theirs will still indicate that there's one unread there for them. Okay, so it's taken the information, uh, put it in your form, and now calls it a client matter for you, it was a claim matter for me, show me how you would yeah. use the information. Yeah. So like, just like you said, if I open this up where it was a claim on your end, it's now a client matter on my end. Now I may want to look through and see what you assigned to me, but also one of the key things you're paying me to do is to reach a settlement on this matter. I just pressed that button and it showed me all the related documents. Now some of these documents go across the wire and are shared with you, others are shared internally. Mm -hmm. But one of them is called settlement information. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to say, you know what, I just spoke to the plaintiff's counsel and you gave me increased authority earlier in the day. Let's say you gave me 80. So settle for 80 rather than 60, which I said right. before. And I'm going to go ahead and offer 80. And I'm going to say down here that I spoke with the plaintiff. Now what happens is, through our little elves here, when I save this, it automatically adds another entry into that log. So it says here that John Raymer changed the amount offered from 60000 to 80000 and was given increased authority to settle for 80000 So the system is automatically, with your L's, annotating what goes on and keeping a log of the activity. Right. So people can see that. Someone could step in and say, mm -hmm. how did we get to where we are yeah, in this matter? Yeah. Trace back over time and see where we are. All right. This is an example of, I think, what you guys call uh, electronic kiretsu. That's the Japanese term for sort of trading group. What does that mean, electronic kiretsu? Yeah. Kiretsu is the Japanese term. And we've added electronic to it to make the notion that here in the States, what you can do is have these trading alliances, but you can do it electronically. And in doing so, change the limits of what's possible yeah. in the everyday work between companies. All right, John, thank you very much. Let's go over here and take a look at WordPerfect Office. And Paul, describe Office for me. How does it fit into the groupware category? Okay, WordPerfect Office is a messaging system. It provides communication tools for a group to send electronic mail messages, schedule group appointments, and assign tasks to one another. And you do that all in the WordPerfect environment. These aren't separate programs. That's right. It's all built within one application. All right, we've got a lot of boxes lined up here. Tell me what the hardware configuration okay, is. Okay, here on the right is, is what would be my client application on my desktop, and on the left would be your workstation in your office. So we could be far apart in two different offices. And what's behind you? Okay, behind me we have a network file server. This is so that we can communicate together. And then to the right, we have a server process that we'll use to demonstrate some capabilities today. All right, now show me what's going on in, in your screen right now. Okay, this is the inbox, and this is basically where all information comes in. Email messages that are sent to me come into here. Tasks that are assigned to me come into here. 
phone messages, um, group appointments, they, they all come into this universal inbox. And what are the different kinds of communication tasks I can perform inside Office? Okay, let me go back to our main screen. You can send an electronic mail message, which is pretty standard. You can schedule a meeting, let the computer find when people are free, and then post it on their calendar. And then you can assign tasks as well. All right, show me how you would assign a task to me. I'm over here in my office, and that's my PC. Okay, let's suppose that I wanted to assign a, a task, and, and I would type in your name. And we'll assign it to Ben as well. And we want you to review this contract. Okay. Now, normally this would go to, to you and then to Ben, or, or to you and Ben simultaneously. But I want it to go to you first. And then when you're finished with it, I want it to go to Ben. So I'll do some work on it. Then I would pass it on to Ben. That's correct. And we'll select the 23rd. Now, I'll send that, and that will show up in your office system. All right, so I'm over here at my office and I go click on my calendar on the 23rd and there's the task you just sent me, review this contract. Mm -hmm. All right, you have something called rules in office, which is a pretty clever thing that, that allows me to kind of put some intelligence in there so that my communications can be managed even if I'm not here. How does that work? That's correct. You can ask the computer to perform work <laughs> for you while you're gone. An example would be this vacation rule. What I've done is I've gone in and said for any appointment that's, that's scheduled for me during a certain time, I want it to be delegated to Ben and moved to a, a folder called vacation. Mm -hmm. So that work will still be done while I'm on vacation. And when I get back, I can look in my folder and see what's happened. Sometimes you want to access your email or get into your mailbox, but you're not near a computer. You don't have a laptop with you or you don't have a phone plug or whatever. You can do this just by using a touchtone phone and, and communicate with the email system. That's correct. You, you can pick up a standard touchtone telephone, dial into the system, and listen to your calendar or listen to your mail messages. Right, can I try that with this phone? Let's say I'm at an airport somewhere and I can't get my machine plugged into anything. Okay. Go ahead and give it a try. And I'm going to call into my office and see what happens here. Welcome to WordPerfect Office 4.0. Please enter your personal ID number. So it wants my ID number. Okay, what's actually happening is over here on this machine, you are logging into the system from the telephone, and it's asking for your password. Right, it wants my password now, so I'll put it in my, which is really your password here. You right. have 10 new items to listen to them. Okay, it's verified you, and now it's going to be And it says press 2 for my calendar. Mm -hmm. the calendar day. And, and the next event. Today, an accepted appointment with subject. Computer Chronicle. Will take place in. The Bay Area. From this Monday at 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. To skip to the next item, press 1. To hear the details about this item, press 2. So it says if I press 2, I'll get details. Mm -hmm. this appointment that would be the same as from on my computer double-clicking to see more information. The message is... Demonstrate word perfect office and the telephone interface. That's pretty to impressive. To continue to the next right, item. Thank you very much. Okay, one of the nice things about a real live meeting is that everyone can look at the same information at the same time. Well, the folks at Xerox have come up with a way to do that, even if the meeting's participants are scattered all over the country. The solution is called the Live Board. Anderson Consulting's design team in California is working with its R&D group in Chicago on a project called the Center for Strategic Technology. Team members meet via the Xerox Live Board, an electronic group station which lets people in both locations access and change shared data. I hope I'm not suggesting too many changes. Well, this is the time to do it. Okay. The Live Board is a 486 computer running Windows okay. with an oversized LCD display and infrared pin input. All you need for a hookup is an ordinary modem. Because we treat the, uh, the ink as an object that we put on the board, uh, it, it, it comes in a very compressed form and we're able to send that across ordinary phone lines. So uh, one or more Live Boards can be connected across phone lines and people in, in this location, for instance, and people in Chicago can be working on what's logically and effectively the same surface. For me, uh, it's better than getting on an airplane and flying four hours to Chicago. Uh, but uh, I think that moving forward, uh, it may even turn out to be better than being there. And we may be able to do things using these tools uh, that would make meetings much more effective than if you just had uh, uh, a group of people sitting around a table trying to do things, because there are all kinds of interpersonal things that we can introduce uh, to uh, you know, allow the person who would not normally speak up in a group to get their say in. Files from your desktop can be loaded onto the live board. The information added during the meeting can be saved and organized for later use. 
For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. The ultimate electronic meeting would enable each remote participant to have full access to all the other people and all their data. That's the goal of the virtual meeting room. Here to show us two examples of collaborative groupware are Rick Nishlinas of Eden Systems and also Steve Weisel of Ventana. Let's start with the meeting room, Rick, and, and you're really redefining the word, the notion meeting, aren't you? Uh, very much. Uh, we have said you are really in a meeting in the meeting room. At the same time, there's a lot of things you can do in the meeting room you can't do in a normal meeting, whether it be participating in a meeting from your desk or from your hotel room in a laptop, or anonymous meetings where the identity of the participants isn't known, or even meetings that span across time. All right, so when you say meeting, we don't really mean 10 people all at the same place in the same time or even electronically at the same place. This is a meeting kind of like a, a, an online bulletin board that may go on over days and days. Exactly, and then you can also then vote and then be able to actually assign tasks. Can that kind of meeting be just as valuable as what we think of as a real-time meeting? Actually, it can be more valuable because you can actually sleep on ideas before you have to comment right, on them. Show me what you mean. Okay, for example, here's a, a list of the meetings I'm per currently invited to in the status, whether it be a new meeting or meetings that has been processed progress in the meeting. Let me take you into a couple meetings and be able to show you what it's like in the meetings. This first one is appropriations committee meeting. They've asked if I can attend. Well, it's very important to be able to guard my time. Maybe I'll be on holiday. I'll say no and then we'll be able to see that it shows that I'm not attending that meeting down here. Mm -hmm. uh, in brainstorming, making meetings better meeting here it shows how we have an anonymous meeting where people are brainstorming. Here the first person says no travel and it's anonymous. Nobody's ideas are, are noted unless they say so. Here we said, I'm using this software called Meeting Room and avoided most of my meeting-related travel. Ah, well, and Greg Brown says, oh, and I don't have to pay for your travel either. And then someone says, little time. Uh, besides travel, I find a huge benefit, and I get more information in a fraction so of the time. So the anonymity maybe lets people be more open, more, more free in what they're saying. Exactly. You might be able to actually criticize what the boss says. Okay. Uh, and so in that regard, let me actually add, add a remark in here and ask to see a, a, uh, an example. Any examples of this happening? and then people will be able to see that on their on their screen and be able to provide some examples to me now before I go on I want to know who's in this meeting so I know how to exactly. make comments. Exactly. How do you know who's kind of listening to what you're saying? Exactly. Well I've clicked on the participant list here and I want to find out who Christmas is. Our larger customers have said I may not know who Christmas is or who he reports to mm -hmm. or what he does and each person can add all the information besides Turns whoops it's Chris not a he. It's not a he at all. I okay. obviously don't know Chris very well yeah. do I? Um, now, most meetings are about actually conducting business and making decisions. Let me go into another one where there's a decision in process. Here's this charity lottery meeting. In the charity lottery, I said, I'd like to learn your opinion on offering a prize linked to winning the lottery for charity. See the attached documents. Well, before I vote, I'd like to see this attached document. So I look up here at my attached documents. Just like you would pass around mm -hmm. something around the room, you can actually attach graphics files, word processing reports, even sound bites. So again, you're, not, you're not just chatting here. I mean, you can have a meeting, come to a vote, come to a conclusion. Exactly right. OK, and here's and the so graphic. Here's, here's my pretty Corvette that I'd like to win. Well, if I get a chance to win that Corvette, I'm definitely going to vote for this. So I'm going to. So you vote yes. I vote yes, place my vote. Let me see the results. See if we've got any consensus here. Here's the results tabularly, but then, of course, uh, let's look at the graph of this thing and see what kind of, yes, mm -hmm. everybody wants to have this charity lottery. Great idea. You've got a chalkboard feature in here, too, don't you? We sure do. Chalkboard? Let me go ahead and click on the chalkboard for every one of the meetings. So you can be able to then draw on the chalkboard and be able to uh, uh, have the kind of chalk talk you have in a normal meeting. So you can just leave, leave graphics files in addition to words. Exactly. You can actually put in the background graphics files there and draw on top of them. Okay, the meeting room. Thanks a lot, Rick. Thanks a lot, Rick. Let's go over here and take a look at group systems from Ventana. And what's your approach here with group systems? How would this be different from what we just saw with Rick Steve? Well, we not only address the, the uh, distributed meeting, but we've also found that there's tremendous benefit not only in, the, in, uh, in, in addressing the face-to-face -face meeting, where groups are trying to reach decisions and, and drive consensus. And this uh, technology is all built upon research that's been done at the University of Arizona. And we look at face-to-face -face meetings as a structured meeting where you're trying to get from point A to point B, whereas a distributed meeting is less structured and it goes on over time and we support all of that. So we have a little network set up here. Right, so got in a real time, you have your place, I have my place. We could right. be far apart somewhere. Around and the world. the same meeting. As a matter of fact, we have customers that are participating in meetings from Europe, 
all at the same time. All right, so what's on the screen here? Steve? Well, first of all, you've got your particular session up, and I've got mine up. If you notice, it looks a little different, first of all. Yeah, you have more choices. I have more choice because it's my meeting. I call so you're this. You're sharing this. Meeting. And I'm sharing this. It's my project or my meeting, so I have various options that I have to determine whether I want to let you have them or so not. So you can set the rules of the meeting. You call on the people, right. et cetera, decide when it starts, stops, and right. so on. Right, et cetera. Up top, it's all built around folders, and we organize all the different meetings and projects and teams into individual folders. You might have one for a project action team, for business process reengineering, strategic planning, or just flat out status okay, meetings. Can we have a, a little session here? Sure. Why don't we go ahead and go into uh, the meeting that I created already called click Meeting on this Issues? One? Sure, just click okay. on it, and I'm going to click on it. And we'll be in here in a second. And we're going to see a list of issues that we've seen typically with meetings in the past. So we're having a meeting about meetings. We're going to have a meeting okay. about meetings. We all have pretty strong feelings about meetings, and unfortunately, most of the time, we think they're fairly negative about it. And if we look at, we've got some of the issues that we have out here. They're too long, poor planning, violent agreement, dominant personality. Okay, would these be comments that people attending the meeting in the past sure. put in, something like they that? They could put it in at different time, a different, uh, different place, or same time, same place. And on my side over here, it, it says new. What does that mean? Well, that means that it's something that has come in since the last time you looked at that screen. We really differentiate between old and new information. In a face-to-face -face meeting, we found that very beneficial in that there can be tremendous large amounts of information that are generated and you want to know what is different from the last time you went mm -hmm. in, okay? And also, in addition to that, we have a monitor facility that can track. So if you're going in and out in a distributed standpoint, it'll tell you all the new information, where it is, which particular meeting, which team you're on, and we'll be able to dynamically take you between or new and old information. Steve, show me how you would say, say something at the meeting, and I would have over here see what you had said, for Okay. Example. Well, for example, violent agreement is one of my favorite issues with meeting. Let me go ahead and double-click on it and make a comment on it. Okay, violent agreement means we all agree and still argue for 30 minutes. Right. Right? Ever happen? Yes. Okay. All right, so you're going to, that's the comment you're making. I'm submitting it. Under that particular topic. And I see my, over here on my screen, it's already clicked automatically on the network, and it knows you've just entered a new comment. Right. And it could come back. And it doesn't seem to have it, but if you go into the violent agreement, okay, it should have it. If I go into violent agreement here, it should show you the new information. And see, there's a new and one there. And there's the message you just put in. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and close that off, which okay. is just closing the door. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to just go in and show you a little example of some of the vote tools myself. We go into the vote, which is one of the more powerful. When you, when you generate ideas and brainstorm, that's a very divergent activity where you're really trying to get flush out issues in, in great detail. Then once you've gotten divergence, you try and bring it back to conclusion and convergence. And what I've done is I've taken a list of some of the typical meeting issues, and I've put them into a rank order vote. We want to rank it from the most important to the least important issue. And it's really pretty drag and drop. Just pull it a little. So each of us attending the meeting could be doing the same right. thing. The system is compiling all the data. All the data, right. And you can show us the results of that yep. voting? I can cast my vote and then go in and look at the results, both graphically and numerically. And so in addition to just getting the tally of how many people voted, or you can actually analyze the vote here. Right. We found that to be a very, very beneficial piece of, uh, of technology in that the people, by just seeing the spread of the votes and where they all vote, they see where they agree and where they disagree. All right. So what does this tell this us? This is a graphical representation which says basically that dominant personalities is what we think is one of the most important issues. I'm going to shrink that down a little bit. Yeah, and now we spread? see a tabular spread that's saying if we look here that two people thought it was the number one issue, five the number two, et cetera. And what this is really useful for is it shows us where the spread of the votes are. If we have a lot of consensus, or um, it's no, spent, no, no point in going through and doing violent agreement. Right, right. Okay? If we have a lot of disparity, if there's a large standard deviation, it means we don't agree. It's worth spending some time. Once you've developed consensus, then you can really develop action plans, proposals, and really get the decisions the made. The benefits of the virtual meeting. Yes, sir. All right, thanks a lot. That's our look at Groupware. Stay tuned now for this week's Computer News on Random Access. In the random access file this week, Apple unveiled three new computers based on the PowerPC microprocessor. The risk-based systems are expected to sell at comparable or lower price points than Pentium-based systems. Apple expects the new systems to run PowerPC versions of leading software applications at least two to four times faster than current Macintosh or Intel 486 systems. 
IBM unveiled the first PowerPC-based notebook computer, the RISC System 6040. The portable Unix workstation has an active matrix color display and weighs just under 7 pounds. IBM says the N40 is more powerful than any other notebook computer. Meanwhile, Intel brought out the new 100 megahertz Pentium processor, which runs one and a half times as fast as the original Pentium chip. Also new from Intel, a new 100 megahertz 486 chip called the DX4. Digital Equipment Corporation teamed up with researchers at MIT to fight air pollution. They've developed a software application called GEMS, the Geographic Environmental Modeling System that models air pollution control scenarios. And Bill Gates is reportedly shopping for a publishing deal for a book he'll write on the information superhighway. The spokesman for Microsoft says proceeds from the book will be donated to charity. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Janelle Stelson.